Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to begin the first of a new series that I hope that you'll find interesting. Most of the time when I'm here doing reviews, I'm doing reviews of either brand new gear or gear that's newish and new to myself. But the reality is, is that there are a lot of fantastic lenses, some of which have been in my kit for a long time that I've either never reviewed or not really reviewed up to the standard of how I review lenses today. But these are lenses that have remained in my kit for a reason. They've been durable, they have been effective, and they have survived a whole lot of comparisons along the way. Because as most of you know, anything that's in my personal kit will invariably get dragged out and compared against whatever is the current piece of gear that I'm reviewing that you know is somewhat similar to it. And so the first of those lenses I'm going to look at today is actually a lens that I have owned longer than any other lens and I've never reviewed. And that is the Canon EF 100mm f2.8 LIS USM lens. And this is a lens that not only is it the been in my kit the longest, um, in the fall of this year I'll have owned this lens for 10 years, but also, I mean, and, and during that time, a lot of lenses have come and gone because just like any of you, a lot of times I'm tempted by new gear that I test and there's that gear acquisition syndrome that kicks in. But although this has been in comparison with a lot of other, I've probably compared it against probably close to 20 other macro lenses or lenses with a similar focal length along the way. And um, well, it's still here, it's still standing. And there's a reason for that. And today we're going to explore the reasons why I think that even in 2020 that the Canon 100 millimeter F2.8 L macro lens is still worthy of consideration. Um, it has survived and not only that, I looked over my Lightroom catalog of over that period of time and it was actually, there's only two other lenses that I've used more often than this lens. And that happens to be the very standard 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 and 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 zoom lenses, because I use those a lot for events and weddings. But outside of that, this lens has not only served me well, but it has paid for itself many times over with very practical photography. So let's jump in and let's take a look first of all at the build and what you get in this lens. So things are a little bit different when you're looking at a lens. In this case, I have owned this lens for nine and a half years. In October of this year, I'll have owned it for 10 years. And so it's a little bit different reality. You're not really talking in the abstract any longer. You're talking about real life experience when you've owned a lens and used it for this long. And what I can most certainly say about the, this lens is that it looks basically the same now as what it did when I purchased it. There are no visible scuffs, there's no marks on it, everything functions in the way that it originally did. And, uh, and so that, that's pretty impressive. I mean, and that has been used in, you know, probably around 15,000 photos or so. It has held up remarkably well. And I am careful with my gear. I, I'm not abusive of it. However, it does get used. And so there certainly have been bumps along the way and it has managed to hold up remarkably well. So this is a weather sealed lens. It has gasket here. It does have the flooring coating on the front element. It was one of the early lenses to receive that. And, uh, and so it has a build that is very, very reminiscent of, you know, basically lenses that are being made by Canon right now. They have stuck with a certain, you know, kind of format that um, obviously has worked. I mean, and I've reviewed lenses that feel more premium because they have more metal components, you know, and they just feel a little bit more robust in the hands. But the reality is, is that Canon L series lenses, in my experience, are very durable and they hold up extremely well. And that's obviously the case here. Now, a couple of things about the build itself. This is a lens, obviously, that is designed to potentially be used with a, a tripod collar. It does not come with one. Um, and so you can use it on a tripod collar. I suspect that many people have not made that kind of investment uh, because of the, the cost involved and the fact that the lens is really not all that heavy and it's not incredibly you know, kind of front heavy either. And so it comes in at 1.38 pounds, that's 625 grams. And so that's a fairly moderate weight and probably not going to cause any major issues for anyone. Now, in terms of our diameter here, we're a little over three inches in diameter. That's uh, right under 78 millimeters, giving us a very common 67 millimeter front filter thread. I'm a big fan of that because I find that 
of the lenses that I own, basically 67 millimeters and 77 millimeters tend to be the most common uh, filter sizes. And so um, I've got lots of filters in 67 millimeters, easy to use. I will note that Canon has since then improved its pinch caps and that's a good thing. It is near impossible to reach in there and to pinch to release that. There's just not enough room for your hand to fit into there. And so they've moved to, you know, center pinch caps, which is certainly a useful thing. A minor thing, but certainly worth observing at the same time. Now for a moment on the lens hood itself, it has this kind of flocked exterior. And as you can see, it really is resistant to marking, which is different than earlier uh, Canon lens hoods, like on my 135 millimeter F2 L that I owned. It had a variety of different marks on the lens hood. It was kind of a smoother finish. And so this was a positive move for them. There's a flocked interior. And so, um, you know, it, it does the job and it is, you know, done a good job over the years of, of both shielding the front element and also you know, keeping flare from coming on there. Now, obviously the length does become much more substantial with that lens hood in place. And that is because it is quite a deep one. At the same time, however, um, it is it, it also is a little bit better than what was the 135 L's whose lens hood flared out more. This one does, as you can see, there is some extra, you know, width that's gonna take up in your camera bag because of that, but it's not as pronounced. It doesn't flare out as much and so, also positive there. Now, as far as you know, our various functions here, this is full-time uh, manual override, as you can see, um, and the feel doesn't really change whether you move it in or out of that. As far as the focus throw, it's not a great focus throw length if you're um, if you're wanting to actually manual focus, particularly once you get out of macro range. I mean, let's let's look at it this way. I mean, from 0.48 meters to infinity is that much. I mean, and so there's not a lot of room for precision in this range at all. Really, it is, uh, it's kind of influenced towards focus at macro distances and even so the focus throw is not incredibly long. I've used it a lot as a manual focus over the years, um, you know, cause that's what you do a lot of times with macro. However, it's it's not the absolute best on that that note because the focus throw is not really geared for doing manual focus. This is an, kind of an autofocus first lens. And on that note, it does have a three position uh, focus limiter. And so you have the option of going the full range. You have 0.5 meters to infinity. So, I mean, obviously as far as focus speed, as you can imagine, your focus speed is fairly fast because <laughs> That's how much throw it is. Um, and so if you're shooting more like portrait length or whatever, you know, if clicking that on is going to give you, or even events where you're not using the macro range. If you click it to that, it does just eliminate, usually with macro lenses, if they miss focus and they do the whole big focus rack, that's where the slowdown occurs. That's very true with this lens. Now, um, you also have the option to go just into pure macro range, which is 0.3 meters to uh, 0.5 meters. And so that gives us an idea that our, of our minimum focus distance is um, 0.3 meters. It's about a foot, basically. And that gives you one to one. And, uh, and so, you know, that is a useful uh, working distance of about a foot. However, you do have to account for the fact that the lens itself is nearly five inches in length. And so uh, definitely by the time you account for the sensor, you've got five inches. So that means that you have basically this length, just a little bit further than that left for your minimum focus distance. And so it's not a bad working distance. Um, however, it's not going to be as long as what you'd get with a longer focal length, like the 180 millimeter, for example. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of par for the course with these type lenses. Optical formula is 15 elements in 12 groups. And, uh, and of course, one thing that set this lens apart from previous macro lenses from Canon was the fact that it came with an image stabilizer. And I can tell you having used this lens for thousands and thousands of handheld macros, that image stabilization makes a huge difference. And um, while your best results are always gonna be from a tripod when shooting macro, macro on the fly handheld is possible with this lens and that stabilizer does make a big difference. And so it was the first, I believe, of Canon's lenses to kind of utilize what they called a hybrid um, um, IS, which what that basically meant is it was designed to also function well 
at minimum focus distances and macro, um, you know, kind of distance where the, the requirements for an image stabilizer are a little bit different. And so I will give this lens high marks for holding up well. I've had no mechanical issues with it. I have had obviously no cosmetic issues with it. It is held up remarkably well. So it does get high marks for me in long-term durability. So overall, um, I think the, the thing that stands out to me is that this lens, it has held up remarkably well with, um, you know, 10 years essentially of use. And um, at this stage, literally tens of thousands of photos taken with it, it has held up and looks pretty much just like the day that I purchased it uh, almost 10 years ago. So kudos to them for, I mean, you can talk about, you know, predicting the reliability of a lens and its ability to, you know, its moisture resistance. I've used this lens in a lot of different conditions and it has held up remarkably well. So uh, kudos to Canon for building a lens that lasts in this particular one. Now, of course, when it comes to autofocus performance, there are a variety of factors at play here. This is a USM lens, and so uh, that's Canon's ultrasonic motor, which is a ring-type USM motor that they put in most all of their L-series lenses um, up until you know very, very recently. But even still with the RF mount lenses for mirrorless, I'm still seeing a lot of USM being used. And so it's kind of their tried and true focus system and when it comes to focus speed, the um, as pointed out during our, our segment where we took a look at the build, this will really be determined in a lot of ways about its case use. And so the only time that I find, you know, I remember early on people saying that the autofocus wasn't as fast compared to some things. Now, you know, times have changed. I've now, I'm, I'm, I've switched over basically on Canon front to mirrorless altogether. I've got the ESR. I just sold my 5D Mark IV, mostly because I am going to put that money towards the new um, EOS R5 when it comes out. And it seems to be shaping up to be a camera that I'm going to be personally interested in. And if it's not, I'll save the money and towards something else. But I'm, I'm pretty much all in on mirrorless. So I'm now using it via adapter, but I've used it on all kinds of Canon bodies along the way. And, and so autofocus obviously is going to be somewhat situational to the camera that's being used. But in terms of autofocus speed, if you use it wisely, this lens has a lot of focus speed. Now where you can get messed up is that if you keep the macro macro range engaged, you know, kind of full, and particularly back in the days where the focus systems were less sophisticated with fewer focus points. If you happen to be focusing in an outer point area and you miss that initial focus pull and then you go through a full focus focus cycle, uh, it's, you know, it's that's where your slowdown really occurs. But for most typical usage, and I'll say even so, even more, it's even more true now on a camera with a great focus system like the EOS R that for standard use, this lens focus is really nice and fast. Now, um, at macro distances, there are other factors that can be at play. And so it's still, you know, obviously the nice thing here is that you can, um, you can just touch to focus. And so the, the advent of touch screens has helped with that. But overall, I think the focus is good. Now, what focus is not is quiet by the standard of particularly mirrorless type lenses with stepping motors or, you know, linear motors, um, particularly when shooting video, as you can see here. It's just, it's not quiet and smooth in the way that stepping motors are because USM was not really designed with video in mind, particularly at the age in which this lens was, you know, designed and released to the public. So let's take a look at the image quality and do a quick breakdown of uh, the performance there. So we'll start by looking at distortion and vignette. As you might expect with a lens like this, distortion is basically non-existent. Um, it's kind of important for macro lenses to have low distortion. That's the case here. There definitely is some vignette at f2.8 and you can see after the profile is, is applied, you can see that that vignette is eliminated, but you can see that there is a fairly strong in the corners and then kind of a linear progression towards you fairly you know, clear in the center of the frame. Now, in terms of our resolution, this is on a 30 megapixel um, EOS, EOS R sensor here. So we can see center of the frame looks nice and crisp. To moving to mid frame, we can see that everything looks good here, either on the lines or on the bill. 
and then moving off into the corner, the corner also looks quite good. This is the pattern that I do anticipate with most macro lenses. They kind of need to be designed to be sharp corner to corner, and uh, that is the case here. Now, just to give you perspective on that sharpness with another macro lens, this is the Irix 150 millimeter. Uh, f 2.8 also and so we can see that center of the frame there is not a whole lot of difference between the two the irix maybe has a hair more contrast in the center of the frame as we move off uh, a little further away from center however you can see that there is definitely a difference between the two lenses when it comes to here even if you look at the lines there's better contrast with the canon lens and moving off into the corner there is a notable difference in our contrast be it whether you're looking at lines or looking at the resolving of the details on the bill so stopping down from f 2.8 to f4 shows an improvement in contrast you can see that the text here is more finely resolved there um, on at f4 by comparison taking a look at our bill you know there is a mild improvement in contrast not significant in the lines here a little bit better contrast and off into the corner the same is true it's not a remarkable difference but there is definitely some improvement there so let's check back in at f5.6 with the irix just to give us another point of comparison center of the frame you can see there's a little bit difference in color both of them look really good strong amounts of contrast uh, not a huge amount of difference there uh, moving towards mid frame a little bit better contrast for the canon lens and off into the corner not a lot of difference to be seen there they're both very very sharp right across the frame now so macro lenses often have ability to go to very small minimum apertures, in this case, f32. Now, the nature of uh, diffraction means that a lot of that is set in. And so at f32, you can just see it's kind of like there's a little bit of Vaseline that's been applied over the lens and contrast has been eliminated. I mean, it still is, you're still getting some resolution, but contrast is, is kind of poor. So this is, of course, a one-to-one -one macro lens. And so this is the $2 American bill that was um, there on the test chart. And so if you look at one-to-one -one and at a pixel level, you can see there's great resolution there resolving the fibers of the paper itself and uh, showing you clearly the ink that is there. Uh, here's another part of that same bill. And so we can see you know, just great amount of resolution. You can actually see there is a little little pink fiber that is embedded in that bill, very interesting. But that's the kind of things that pop up when you look at something at this kind of magnification. Now, macro lenses uh, do need to control uh, longitudinal chromatic aberrations uh, because of they're often put in situations where they're resolving very critical details. And so you can see, I would, I've would i always found that the Canon doesn't correct as completely as some competitors, particularly I've done a about three or four apochromatic um, macro lenses, and they're a little bit better on this. You can see a little bit of purple fringing before, a little bit of green fringing afterward. But you can also see it's not highly pronounced. Here's another example here. And, and so this is actually an old Israeli coin here. And so you can see there is great fine detail being rendered on that. Um, lots of information there. And so some chromatic ab aberrations, but not bad. Here's an old Egyptian uh, pound note. And so once again, uh, you can see detail right into the fibers are resolved there very nicely. Now, when it comes to the bokeh from the lens, if you're looking surely on a ge geometry level, you can see that geometry is not really amazing. There is definitely some deformation towards the edges of the frame. And here at F4, rather than that kind of completely rounding, there's almost like some clipping that is taking place. And so you get, you know, imperfect geometry. Now down to F5.6, now we get the circular shape across the frame. However, you can see the nonagonal shape, the nine aperture blades, you can actually see them. And so it's, there are lenses that do a little bit better job on this aspect of bokeh than what the Canon does. Real world bokeh, however, is nice and creamy. And uh, if it's not so much about geometry and it's more just about a nice creamy defocused, this is compared to the Laudwa 100 millimeter F 2.8. This is an apochromatic lens. And so what you can see is that while it's not intense here, if you take a look up in these areas, you can just see that the bokeh is softer on the Canon. And uh, that is probably the advantage of not being perfectly corrected for those longitudinal chromatic aberrations. There often is a slight correlation between the softness of the bokeh and 
completely eliminating all chromatic aberrations. And where they are completely eliminated, the bokeh tends to be a little bit more defined and a little bit less soft. And so I've always found the Canon to have a nice combination between those two things. Now, over the years, I've always been happy with the images I get out of this lens. There's plenty of resolution there. And so taking a look here, you can see that, you know, all of these textures are really nicely rendered. And of course, I, I find these old bellows cameras to, like this to be such great photography subjects. Now, uh, this is a lens that I've used a lot over the years, like for weddings. And so you can see a uh, focus is nice. Look at the skin tones here. You know, of course, this is something that Canon is often good at. And you can just see skin tones are very, very natural and nice. Uh, here's an example of a product shot that I've done. I've done with this lens a lot of product shots over the years for companies. And so this was um, just a, a device, kind of a do-it-all device for in cars. And you can see, you know, in this shot, I've actually got some fine mist that's falling to kind of give an effect, but you can see that detail is really great. It's just been a really great tool for that in a variety of situations over the years. And so in the wrap up here, I'm going to just show you some photos while I do a little bit of voiceover. I've been shooting with this lens for a long time. And so I'll let the photos speak for themselves. But as I've said, I've compared this against a lot of lenses along the way. And what I found is that while there are lenses that are a little bit sharper, um, I have found that the overall package just produces images I've been very happy with. The combination of enough resolution with nice enough bokeh rendering has left this as a lens that just gets the job done. And as I've noted, it's paid for itself many times over with you know, images that have met the satisfaction of the various clients that I've either shot for or for myself when I'm just shooting to, um, you know, to produce images that I'm going to be happy with. So while there certainly are more options today, including more options that have an image stabilizer built into a macro lens that one, than what was available when this lens was released, I still think it's a viable option. It's 749 US dollars, and so there are cheaper alternatives, even cheaper alternatives with image stabilization, like one of the Tamron 90 millimeter um, F2.8 macros, and I believe Sigma has 105 millimeter um, F2.8, and those are all good lenses. But for some of you, I know you are most comfortable putting a Canon lens on a Canon body. And if that's you, this is a lens that is still worthy of consideration. I'm Dustin Abbott. If you'll look in the description down below, there is a linkage to an image gallery if you want to look at these photos for more than just a second or so. And so you can check that out. There is also buying links there if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And of course, lots of linkage to support this channel, to follow me on social media, become a patron, sign up for my newsletter. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.